Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm Sean. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies, 1975 to 1995. And this week, have we got one that's actually a little bit off the beaten path compared to what we've chosen recently. In this first quote-unquote season, like our, our reintroduction of the podcast, we've talked a lot about probably what are bigger action movies other than Showdown and Little Tokyo, but other ones have been like, they, they were honest and true blockbusters and this one flies way under the radar for many reasons <laughs> many many reasons why it should always fly under the radar being a denzel washington movie it, it's definitely not one of the ones that jump out at you when you think of denzel yes that is true we are of course talking about the 1991 great action movie regardless of what melissa says ricochet which came out on October 4th, 1991. It is directed by Russell Mulcahy. He directed a ton of music videos, including Video Kill the Radio Star, the first music video on MTV, and like hundreds of others. But too. did he actually do any other movies, or is that all he did? He did do lots of movies, but not, not, none of them too huge, but probably a couple movies that we'll get to. Resident Evil Extinction, eh. Scorpion King 2, Eh. Highlander okay, wait, and wait. Highlander hey. 2. Okay, I'm on board for Highlander. <laughs> <laughs> it is written by Steven D'Souza, who we talked about last week, who also wrote both the Die Hards, 48 Hours, Commando, Street Fighter, The Running Man, Judge Dredd. He is a legend of Hollywood writers and fits right into the theme of this podcast in action movies from 75 to 95. So you're and, saying we're probably going to talk about him again? Oh, yeah. I, it's almost guaranteed that we're <laughs> going to talk about him again. Because who produced this? Joel Those, motherfucking Silver. Yeah, of course. That's who. <laughs> and if there was ever a theme that we had during this first run of the podcast being back, it's we did Joel Silver yeah, movies. it's what it is. <laughs> Apparently he did every action movie that was ever done in that era. I'm pretty sure he gets a producer credit. If it's going to be packaged in a DVD box, he gets a producer credit. <laughs> <laughs> As we mentioned, like this one flies way under the radar. And it did when it came out, too, because it didn't gross that much money in theaters. It was kind of, even for being a Denzel movie. At the, for 1991, a Denzel movie, it flew way under the radar. And as you know, we do not take sponsorship for this show. This is one that we do for free for the internet. We just give this one away because we love just having so much fun when it comes to making these podcasts and talking about internet. action movies yes you are welcome <laughs> you are welcome to hear our voice every other week and, and you know we do not accept any advertising or sponsorship or or anything i mean unless you want to send us money like we'll take your money oh yeah give if us you money want to send it to us, yeah we'll take it <laughs> we'll take it like no questions asked we'll take the money <laughs> but with that said this episode is brought to you by fudge striped chapstick <laughs> when you need <laughs> to have chocolatey but also not chocolatey lips but stripe chapstick we got you covered it's just right after the holidays you know you know what you got in your stocking but stripe chapstick man that is hard to say say it four times <laughs> those damn keyboard elves better be paying us good for this plug <laughs> So without much further ado, and our fake advertisements aside, by the way, if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash go with the heat. You can find the ways that you can give us money uh, or, you know, just I don't know, pick an address and send some cash. <laughs> we don't have if an you address give us there. enough money, we'll actually create fudge striped <laughs> chapstick. <laughs> just a bunch of cookies mashed into a plastic tube. <laughs> with some Vaseline. <laughs> Stick together. <laughs> Without much further ado, speaking of Vaseline, because this Denzel gets naked real fast in yeah. this movie. <laughs> Let's go talk about Ricochet. So this movie starts off with a bang, as in straight to the credits. Straight to the credits <laughs> and the creepiest music you've ever heard. Someone is going to die or something suspenseful. It's like gonna... something out of a Halloween movie. I don't know. Yeah, I kept waiting for something to jump out in the credits. <laughs> Yeah, it scared the crap like, out of me. Going, like, get murdered as soon as we come from back from the credits. <laughs> Maybe because this movie takes place in the Die Hard universe. More on that later. Maybe it's finally the time where. McLean was going to kill someone for getting his t car towed. Yeah, maybe that's it. But <laughs> <laughs> this is a warning. This ain't John McLean. Denzel, not John McLean. No. He will shoot first and take off his clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so, because we don't have much of an open, we're going to get straight into the guest stars because this movie is stacked with people, especially for the early 90s. If, who, uh, who's who of the oh, early yeah, 90s is in true. this movie? 
John, what do you got for us this week? Well, let's just start out with Denzel Washington, who plays Nick Styles. He actually just had a birthday on December 28th. He turned 65. Happy birthday, Denzel. So- <laughs> he went to Ford- Fordham University and studied journalism, but before he graduated, he get the acting bug. His first big role was 81's Carbon Copy. He spent six years on the sitcom St. Elsewhere playing Dr. That. Philip Chandler. I didn't know yeah. that. He was on yeah, St. Elsewhere. Actually, yeah. But I don't think I don't think it was a sitcom, though. I think it's like a drama. Yeah, yeah. But either way, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just on TV. I didn't yeah. know he was yeah. on. I didn't know that either. Yeah. I thought he started out in soap operas or something. Hmm. Well, maybe St. Elsewhere is a soap opera. Maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I don't I've know never a seen ton it. about the show. <laughs> It'll be a little before your time, John. So, (laughs) yeah, nineteen eighty-two. As the youngest member of this little, (laughs) little before my time, I hear it was good. (laughs) His film career really broke out in the late eighties and early nineties with movies like Glory and Malcolm X, The Hurricane, Philadelphia. But he just—I mean, guy—he's been so many great movies. I feel like I could just kind of go on just naming movie after like movie i mean even now like he's doing the equalizer movies i love book of eli i know a lot of people probably don't i did want to mention why well, i knew you obviously you're going to start off with denzel because he's our, our main character in this movie but denzel is a sneaky action star and he's in a ton of tony scott movies like a lot of tony scott yeah. movies i know it's not in the era in which we are talking about movies 75 to 95 he's not in that many action movies but since like the year 2000 he's been in a lot the, the equalizer movies the, the bone, bone collector. collector yeah obviously john you mentioned the book of eli john q out of time man on fire the manchurian candidate uh, uh, safe house yeah he is a sneaky action star and in fact if you look at the the uh, mount rushmore of action movies or action stars who got Sly and Arnie and Bruce Willis and people like that. But you know who should always be on that Mount Rushmore is Denzel, Wesley Snipes, and Billy Blanks. But somehow, okay, I could, I could, I could make a case that <laughs> Billy Blanks don't belong with Wesley Snipes and Denzel Washington. Though. I'm sorry, Billy. I love Let's you. Get carried away. Let's, I love you. You're entertaining. But if John Claude Van Damme's uh, well. not up there. <laughs> <laughs> then Billy Blanks don't get his face up there either. <laughs> Same. <laughs> now, Denzel Washington, yes. Wesley Snipes, for sure, yes. He should be up there. The last thing I'll tell you guys, he's actually got four kids. They're actually all really well-educated. I didn't know his son, John David Washington, is former football player. He actually signed with the Rams for a little bit as a running back. Mm, um, damn. He's also got a, gotten into acting, so you might see him more in upcoming stuff. Our next actor is John Lithgow gal who plays earl talbot blake believe it or not he was an accomplished stage actor before he really got into movies and stuff that he actually it was after his first divorce that he got into fo- he put more of a focus on movie but he'd actually already won like a like two or three tony probably best known for his role as dick solomon on third rock from the sun which is the sitcom that he was on for like five or six years but he's also the dad from harry and the henderson you know after that scene you see him slapping harry in the face you can never look at john lithgow the same he's also been in some other like more serious stuff he was in terms of endearment and uh the world according to cart so other tv stuff he played winston churchill in the crown series and he was actually he played a serial killer on one of the seasons of dexter and it's actually one of the better one of the best seasons probably uh, arguably one of the last good seasons of dexter that's pretty consistent with john lithgow where you can point to he's been in stuff where over Overall, like the world according to Garp, not such a great movie. And I love Robin Williams, but John Lithgow was clearly the best part in that movie. He's written a, a bunch of children books and done like children songs, and he does podcasts and voice work. Pretty busy guy. Fun fact though, he turned down playing the role of Dr. Fraser Crane on Cheers. Oh, wow. Our next guest star is Ice T, who plays Odessa. His real name is Tracy Morrow. He's a legendary hip hop MC, but as I say that, He's also played Detective Tutuola on Law and Order's Sexual Victims Unit for 446 episodes, or essentially Holy 20 years. Shit. There are that so many at this episodes point, of that? Yeah, at this point, is he more well-known for playing a detective on TV or being a hip-hop MC? Over 400 episodes? I would say he's better for, 
being known for being a detective on a cop show. So let's forget all that cop killer stuff and let's talk about him as a cop. Because he seems to play a cop a bunch. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, no, so Ice T's pretty interesting, man. Like, he's from Crenshaw. He joined the army. He spent four years in the army. When he got out of the army, he was a jewel thief and a pimp. I guess he learned how to be a pimp while stationed in Hawaii, by the way. <laughs> And Ice T is a reference to a fabled pimp, Pimp Iceberg Slim, mm. which I guess they were novels or something. But <laughs> so basically, this movie is right around the beginning of his acting, which is right at the height of his hip hop career. And I'll touch a little bit more on him in music, other film stuff. Uh, around this time, he was also in New Jack City and a movie we may cover coming soon called Trespass. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Actually, you know what's funny about Ice T is that. When you see his early acting, you're like, how did he get cast in a TV show that has over 400 episodes? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and that's pretty much with his with his movie list, aside from like John and Demonic, that's pretty much what you get. Except go out and see Leprechaun 5 in the hood. <laughs> he has got the greatest afro at the beginning of that. Um, just go see it. Isn't he in Breaking 2? I think he's... And, it, and I'm going to touch on that in music is that he actually did a song for that movie, but it didn't mm. end up on the soundtrack. Oh, okay. But it's okay. in the movie. Got it. Okay. But that brings us to Kevin Pollock, who plays Larry Doyle. He is an actor and comedian. I even said this when we first started watching this movie. I was like, guys, do you remember when Kevin Pollock was in everything? <laughs> because he kind of really kind of has been. Like, at least in the 90s, he was like in every movie. He was in the whole nine yards, the whole ten yards, casino, grumpier old man, grumpier old man, the usual suspects, a few good men. Like he's, His first role was actually in 1988's Willow, which I do not remember him willow no i don't remember that either <laughs> that's the one one movie where i could say i do not remember kevin pollock being in <laughs> so he still does a bunch of stand-up plus he's been doing the kevin pollock chat show from 09 till 2009 so for the past decade he's had his own chat show all right so and that pretty much touches on our big name guest stars we're gonna do a couple quick shout outs so I'm going to shout out to John Amos, who plays Reverend Styles. He was in our Die Hard 2 episode from last week, which uh, he showed up in other than Die Hard 2. You might know him from Good Times and Coming to America. We also have Lindsay Wagner, who plays D.A. Priscilla. She's been in a bunch of stuff you've probably never heard of. She played Jamie Summers in the Bionic Woman mm. TV show from 1976 to 78, plus all the TV, TV movies of the Bionic Woman. Damn. She's done a bunch of activism stuff and been in a bunch of other stuff. But nothing like, like, that would be the only thing you would know her from, really. Mm -hmm. And then the last one I'm going to throw in there is Mary Ellen Trainer. You would probably know her, know her as the kidnapped sister in Romance the Stone. Or playing Dr. Stephanie Woods in the Lethal Weapon series. She was also the mom in The Goonies. And she was also in Die Hard. Um, who did she play in those Die Hard movies? Gail Wallens. The news anchor that covers both in Die Hard 1 and Die Hard 2. And she is also the news anchor in Ricochet, which means that Ricochet and Die Hard are in a shared universe. Yeah, she plays the same character, and that's weird. It's a shared universe. I know, that is weird. And I, it actually would be kind of funny if there was a mention to, like, Dr. Tommy Tower in it or something like that. Man, you know, by the end of this movie, like, he could have used Bruce Willis's character. Like, <laughs> was he not working in L.A. at that point? Yeah, exactly. He could have used he, another partner. Is this, when he was a, is this when he was a P.I. with Damon Wayans? <laughs> hey, he could have been at Dole's airport at the exact same time. It's just, you know, he was on the other side of the country. Oh, my God, they should have got Al Powell. Oh, yes. <laughs> And those are your guest stars. When we open up after the credits roll, we go into the most intense game of basketball between Ice-T, Kevin Pollock, and a man that looks similar but is not Denzel Washington. <laughs> <laughs> he is slightly taller and can play basketball significantly better. It, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that he's a better basketball player than Denzel. Denzel might be able to work the, the outer edge. You know, work the key pr pretty good. I don't know. He might he might be able to, but he's definitely not dunking. That and Kevin Pollock really stands out in this scene. <laughs> he legitimately looks out of breath. He was out of breath before they started filming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Ice T, his hair, those locks are ridiculous. Did you see the, that flow, <laughs> that hair he's got? It's great. It's the, the hair in this movie, it's so early 90s. It's so awesome. After the basketball game is over, there's some other women that were just hanging out watching the basketball game. The, but Denzel didn't know. Maybe he knew some of them. Or I should say Nick. Nick didn't know them, but he has his eyes on one in particular and goes hard after her before she has a chance to leave, including writing her a fake ticket with his phone number on it. Yeah, and actually, it kind of ends when she finds out he's a cop. She didn't seem too impressed. You know, pigs don't get a lot of respect in this neighborhood. <laughs> This scene, of all the scenes that are in this movie, this one ends up being one of the most important because you see who ends up being his wife later in the movie. And then you also see how he's cutting ties with his past. That he sees that I see is stealing cars, says that they can't hang out anymore. He's a cop, but he's going to school to become a lawyer. Like he's, You see how he's ditching his former life for what his new life is going to be. That's him being the DA and then him getting married and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely setting up the trajectory of how things are going to unravel. And so, like, we jump to their first beat, a normal festival beat uh, <laughs> with the with the goofiest-looking band, like, 90s <laughs> band, like, Flock of Seagulls <laughs> band. It just... What kind of festival is this? The the band, and then there's this one guy that's in the front. He's, like, standing up on the stage with the band. But he is having the most amazing time listening to He's slapping the banister, shaking his head, big smile on his face, and he sta- he stands up straight and starts clapping his hands along to the music. You get all of this in a fraction of a second as the camera pans, but trust me, it is worth it to go back and check out this guy <laughs> and how much fun he is yes. having with this band. At the same time, there's this deal that's going down where Blake is going to rob his own people? Question mark. Is that what's going on here? I don't know. I So it's really weird because... He, they make a point to say, shut up, man. It's an inside job. Do you want them to find out? So it's like, okay, so it's an inside job. But they never really elaborate how it's an inside job beyond that. And then he's robbing what I couldn't decide were either Yakuza or <laughs> I wasn't sure what was going on. All I know is that John Lithgow clearly thinks he's more of an athletic thief than he really is. Yeah, I because don't after what a, the plan is. I, I don't know. Like, they just go in and rob them and shoot them, and then the noise attracts the cops, and he jumps through a window to get away. He jumps from, doesn't... like, the third story window out into the festival. He, like, jumps into Nick's lap, where his partner is out back de- dealing with Blake's partner. So then it leaves Blake and Nick in the middle of the festival to, to this is where Nick starts to take all of his clothes off to prove that he doesn't have any other weapon on him, which psych he does in his ass. So at this point, who did this first? Lethal Weapon or Ricochet? It would be Lethal Weapon because the first Lethal Weapon is like 1986-ish. Okay, so we're ripping off Lethal Weapon when he gets strips down to his underwear kind of deal, but for dumber reasons, because like there's no point. He just automatically starts taking his pants off. I well, think he just wanted to get naked. <laughs> well, first... That lady was in there taking a dump, and then she just comes running out and just happens after taking a shit, just walks into <laughs> this standoff that's happening, and then gets taken captive. Which, if you know anything about porta potties, it's not like sinks in those or anything. So, like, ugh, ugh, ugh. but he's got her <laughs> captive, and then that's when Nick starts taking off all of his clothes to prove that he doesn't have any weapons on him. After. Nick gets all of his clothes off. He then pulls that gun out of his butt and shoots Blake in the knee and then knocks him out after Blake pulls a knife. Classic gun butt. (laughs) All cops carry a gun butt. (laughs) Well, back at their precinct, and this is where we find out how he hides it. The chief is not happy, but the district attorney, D.A. Priscilla, is happy with the the good publicity that this, hey, this young cop has a future with us, and it makes us look good because, you know, the L.A. cops, they're not, you know, not always in the best light. And so this is actually, actually ends up being really good for them. And so she co- just comes barging into the locker room, and Nick yeah, shows and her that little pouch in the back of his, under in the back of his jo- he sh- jock strap. He shows her more than the little pouch. She storms into the locker room, he's standing there butt naked, and she basically sexual harasses him for like three minutes. It's really uncomfortable. <laughs> Someone needs to call HR. <laughs> Too bad she is HR. <laughs> 
she promotes him right on the spot to detective to supersedes the chief the chief that doesn't get the choice there. So at the prison hospital, Blake is just beside himself in how badly things went. All he's doing is reliving the moment again and again and again in his head. That's when he gets his idea. You know what the solution to this is? Taping books to my body. Okay, yeah. So he just couldn't wait for the doctor to come in and put that back into place because I don't understand this scene because he doesn't do anything after that. It's not like he leaves. It's not like he breaks. He just, he just snaps his knee back in by himself and then lays there again. Like, okay, well... I got some more time to kill. <laughs> well, and this time in prison is very strange because he gets it stuck in his head that he's going to go after him. And he does this weird thing with the books. The next few times we see him, gladiator time, and then yeah. he's getting a crew together. And like, this is very strange. If he would have just behaved, do you think he would have got out sooner? <laughs> yeah. Probably. Like rather than murdering someone, like he, he when they move him, the next scene they show is like then him being moved from place to place, right? And like, oh, well, we have to take him out of the cell block, whatever, because he murdered everybody over there. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, we uh, bring, and then they put him with Jesse the body. <laughs> and he well, we get him. A, we, we get a quick scene before then oh, where yeah, we see true, yeah. that Denzel is apparently fighting crime on TV, followed by the love boat. <laughs> and I want to watch the love boat. Am I the only one? I don't want to watch Busted. He's just on the meteoric yeah. rise to he in five short years. That's how much time passes in this movie. In five short years, he's able to go from police officer to detective to now assistant DA. That seems kind of far-fetched, don't you think? I mean, Priscilla did see him in the locker room. And so when she was picking out assistants, but, she was thinking about <laughs> Nick. <laughs> but come on now. Yeah, but he gave up his whole career on Busted. Like, they could have gotten into syndication. <laughs> I know, right? He could have done a spinoff with, with Steven Seagal. <laughs> Like, that would have been awesome. <laughs> Down in the bayou? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but you're right. The prison scenes are really weird. And I, I want to come back to the book thing. Because he takes those two books and he wraps yeah. them around his leg. And he does like a thing to his knee. And that's why you don't give prisoners books. <laughs> <laughs> but then the book thing persists. Because then after he knocks out the cream puff or Jesse v- Ventura when he gets into his cell. Because he calls them cream puffs. So that's why I'm going to continue to call them cream puff. They have Vaseline. Jesse... The body. Ventura has Vaseline in his prison cell. And I didn't know, I thought that would be contraband. But apparently they're down with safe <laughs> sex. Like, like, they want you to be comfortable. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. All I know is he bre- he destroys the sink. And it's like, great. Now there's not going to be any more hand washing. Yeah. The rest of the time we're in here together. Also, Jesse the you body know. is laying in the toilet. So where are you going to take a crap at? <laughs> Well, and then apparently him and Knuckles, they become like friends because we see him later in, in the gladiator scene going at it. And then he kills Knuckles. I, the book thing, though. Like, why is why? What about the book thing? Why does why? he have books taped to him? Why? What is the purpose uh, of because this? Because it's supposed to be like it's supposed to be. That's all they can get their hands on. Right. So that's their armor. They're like, that's how they protect. That's what well, doesn't really work, obviously. But I don't but, know why it's a. Thing for the movie why is jesse the body not wearing books he's wearing newspapers yeah. right and we find out later that blake isn't much of a fighter he spent all that time training with all those books on him in the gladiator fights in in the american gladiator style arena that they have in this prison but he gets whooped hand to hand easily by the assistant district attorney because he's I'm sorry. It's not believable that John Lithgow could hurt anybody. <laughs> well, I mean, of the that's least believable say, things like, in this movie. <laughs> yeah, like the bad guy's the dad from Harry and the Hendersons. Exactly. So, like... He cried when he hit Harry in the face. <laughs> sorry, I don't buy it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apparently, he's uh, he didn't feel quite as bad about killing Knuckles. Yeah, Knuckles. No. <laughs> Throughout the the prison scenes, we are getting peppered with scenes of. Denzel Washington having a lovely life uh, <laughs> uh, on the outside. He's getting married. He's having kids. He's he's an attorney now, and people like him. He's even got a terrible mustache. There's this thing about a missing mustache. witness, but we don't need to talk about that. We don't need to address any missing witnesses. Don't worry. His best friend will save the day for him. <laughs> that courthouse scene is great, too. You see, like, he's this really powerful attorney. He's able to make a great speech to turn the case in their direction. He does that thing where he like, screams and he's going to run outside and he turns around. I'm telling you, 
And I'm with John here. The mustache makes him less trustworthy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because it's essentially yes. the same scene from Philadelphia, right? Where he's doing a powerful well, scene and you believe him in that. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's this mustache is going to come back to haunt him pretty quick here. <laughs> I don't think it's the mustache per se as it's the skinny mustache. Mm -hmm. If he had a regular like thick mustache, it would be okay. But that pencil thin mustache (laughs) makes him look like he's some kind of cartoon villain or something. (laughs) This is something that stood out to me in this movie. Obviously, Denzel, his character is always like really his strong personality. He takes unnecessary risks, but he's always really charming. Mm -hmm. And that's like the Denzel character. That's like always his thing. He's super charming. And that's and he's overly confident that in every Denzel movie that comes back around he's super confident in the beginning and that bites him in the ass and then he's got to get humble before he can get even yeah. right that's like the the den- the mm-hmm. training day Denzel <laughs> it's it's always well, the same even, formula <laughs> we even get a scene kind of amp up his like hubris at this point now that he's like this successful dad and involved in the church like he even goes to his old basketball buddy Odessa's meth lab and like tries to tell him like don't be selling meth to kids and you know stay away from the christian center because i Mm -hmm. work there on tuesdays (laughs) i'm gonna work there on tuesdays i haven't got it done yet though i haven't paid for it but when we do pay for it you better not show your face around there (laughs) he leaves early from his baby's baptism to go talk to him tell him about because his passion project is to start this community center at the towers Youth center. Yeah. Um, but he's got to, you got to get the drugs out of there. So he goes to his old buddy to say, Hey, quit selling drugs to kids in my neighborhood. If you do it in your neighborhood, whatever, like have fun, go at it. Like, but not in, not in my yeah. neighborhood. I thought that was a little wrong to bring up. His brother's head was missing when they buried him. Like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, we, we counseled uh, do, do your you know mother's <laughs> meth lab you're in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty cocky. I mean, <laughs> You already got a dude that looks like LT standing by the door. Like, a, <laughs> what, was we're serious me? about our meth here. There were some old gangsters in that that crew. <laughs> some <laughs> yeah. of them were like, I thought one of them was Jim Brown from it. <laughs> like, wow, that guy's really old looking. <laughs> Important part here is that again, he's so confident, so over the top, so focused on that nothing can ever come back around on him. He's even turning down other people asking him, you should get into politics. Like, that's not for me. But that he's leading these community groups. That's where he's at the dinner. And he's talking to the waitress who thinks that he's famous. Like, there's all this stuff. He's super overconfident. In prison, Blake's partner, his whatever, whatever that, that guy, guy is, I don't know what he, guy gets, is. he gets released. And that's the person who's going to go set up all the stuff on the outside so that Blake can pull off this um, con or the setup of yeah. Nick when he gets out. He's like a crony, basically. He just does. It's like a mm. like a lab dog or something. He's the he's the inside man. So let's get to this parole hearing because this is one of the best scenes in the movie. It's Blake's parole. He has his court appointed lawyer. Court appointed lawyer saying, "Just shut up. Let me do the talking. This will be over really fast. Let's just go in there and get this done." They go in. There's two guards and then the four people on the parole board. And they're asking some pretty dumb questions like, what would you do on the outside? It's kind of like just humoring yeah. him. Yeah, there's no way they were going to let him out, right? <laughs> yeah, like there's, I mean, he's in there for what, armed robbery, like attempted murder and stuff. Well, he murdered all his other guys, though, like the, the other bad guys. So I think. Plus those people he murdered in prison. Yeah, the all, yeah, never mind oh, that. Like yeah, he's, yeah. he has not been a, st- and they try to say like, so it's why his, are we even upbringing that, <laughs> and that those people that why he are killed we even were having a meeting then? Yeah, exactly. That all those people he killed like, were Aryan Brotherhood people, and so like that, that his lawyer was trying to be like, it's okay that he killed those people. <laughs> they, they, they were, were bad people. <laughs> they were bad people. He well, had a bad childhood. I'm sorry. It's a sad story. <laughs> killed so many people in prison. Think that they would take more precaution with him, but uh, clearly they don't because he easily kills everyone in the room and walks out of the prison dressed as a lawyer. My biggest. Biggest question here is not the pen gun because we we saw that before on on Vice that we saw that someone had pulled out that little mini handmade pen gun and but, Con Air I believe oh yeah that's right yeah Con Air they have them yeah too. but I also want to call out they were doing construction in that wing of the prison and they were having prisoners 
use the power tools. Like, what do you have to do in prison to be allowed to get that job where you get to work a circular saw? I know. I, I just, I not that I have any experience, but I'm pretty sure they do everything <laughs> across the television screen these days. So, like, you're not even in the same room. I Yeah, I don't, I guess it's like, it's the power tool thing that really stood out to me. I know that prisoners get the opportunity to, under good behavior, they can work on, on be a part of, different projects and stuff right but he's mm-hmm. clearly in a maximum security prison and they have power tools with like one guard overseeing them while they use these power tools i think what, what what we're getting to is that this isn't the prisoner's fault this is the prison's fault for allowing this to happen yeah so like he and he basically just walks right out of the prison he would have made it too but he had to shoot that damn bookmobile guy <laughs> They get to the drop-off location, money and clothes staged by his crony. And the person that helped him get out, like, hey, we'll meet up in a week at this bookstore. I'll have passports and money. We'll be able to get out of the country. I hate that you're going to take care of this one local thing, but do your thing. Then we'll meet up. And then he shoots that guy, shoots him in the knee. Then they push the bookmobile. Poor bookmobile. All those books. I know. Uh, like they, they just trashed the bookmobile. There's so many people that are doing the, the gladiator stuff that they can't now because they burned up the bookmobile. <laughs> Not sad about that old man, though. It's the bookmobile. <laughs> <laughs> they push off and able to stage Blake's death. And later when we hear from the DA, after Nick finds out that they had the same... Uh, sorry, from the reporter. Yeah, the reporter tells them, what do you think of this? That has a wound in the knee and then also that they did dental records. And I don't know how the hell they did that. No, remember that he he yeah. switched them. Remember he, the, his crony was while well, he was getting examined and stitched up oh, in prison. When they were doing the like when he was like at the, like the Kinkos thing. Yeah. Like he's oh standing. yeah, that's so, what that and was. The, and the, the guy who was his crony is like whatever his guy that followed him around like a dog. He was in there switching dental records with that guy because it was the plan all along with with the okay. Aryan Brotherhood right. guy. That makes more sense. So so Come far on, so <laughs> far plans going off with a hitch. So let's go to let's see what's next on the list. Dressed like a homeless guy outside the courthouse. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. <laughs> Nick finds out about Blake escaping, but then also dying. But Nick can't talk. He's got too much charity work going on. He's got multiple assistants that he's dictating to them to what to do. And also, they're going to be doing a fundraising telethon at, telethon at his dad's church. They're not going to do it somewhere else. They're going to do it at the church live. And this is when, John, you're talking about that Blake is following him around. He's dressed as a homeless guy. He's able to get into that restaurant and, and overhear the restaurant conversation. And then he has everything perfectly staged where he cuts the power to Nick's house, then knocks on the door as the power guy. Who is this babysitter? That bitch would be fired. <laughs> Who is this babysitter? What person that works for the power company comes in and says, I'm here to fix your power. By the way, it's my birthday. Let's have some cake. Yeah, what with the these kids. hell yeah. are you doing? As a former There's nanny a and babysitter. <laughs> You are fired. <laughs> yeah. They're singing happy birthday. They're having cocoa and hanging out. Ultimately, it ends with him drugging her. But at the same time, like, I don't, I think whether or not he drugs her, like, she probably would have let him put the kids down anyway. <laughs> I think he drugs all three of them because the kids are, like, passed out. So I think it's all, all it's like all, all three of them are drugged. Because also, like, you can see when he carries them up, the kids are like rag dolls. Like, I just can't get over this babysitter. Sorry. I have to go back to, I can't, I can't get over it that. The power company comes to fix the power, and you're like, yeah, sure, you come out of my house. Oh, my God, it's your birthday. Let's have some cake and blow some candles. Turn the fucking power back on. Yeah, also, but yeah. Let, let's talk about the mom, though, because she calls the mom, and the mom's like, oh, honey, you called the power company. They're going to take forever. And then the baby's just like, oh, never mind. They're here. As a mom, you're not like, that's really weird. I should probably go check on it. Uh-huh. Like, just go home and check. It's, I mean, you live in the, you're in the same town you live in here, okay? <laughs> like, you drive your ass home and you check on your children, and then you come back to your husband raising money for other people's children. <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk about the telethon, too. No one thought it was suspicious that they were able to raise, like, like what, a hundred grand during their telethon being on public access TV. Yeah, it was 500 grand. 500 grand. 500 yeah. grand, yep. So, and then he suspiciously, the last 10,000 comes in cash in a box with a letter of, like, I'm never going to forget you. <laughs> Lawyer, you ruined man. my life. Like, the letter was like, you, but as I was saying, get when he was reading it, it was like, I'll never forget the way you ruined my life, basically. It wasn't saying, like, you saved me. It was reading, like, I hate your ass. <laughs> <laughs> All of this is going Charles Bronson film. Like, John Lithgow's going to murder his whole family, and then Denzel's going to have to, like, go on a revenge tour. 
But <laughs> Lithgow's actually a gentleman throughout most of this. Like his plan is devious. He he executes it excellently. Instead of uh, murdering his kids, he just takes some video, leaves, and uh, locks the house up before uh, he leaves. Yeah, turn, leaves the power on and moves on to the next part of his plan. His diabolical genius plan. <laughs> The next phase of his plan, too, is to stage the person who's going to do the deposit of all the money that they raised. He goes without backup, without help, with without anyone. He's like, this is my neighborhood. $500,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He checks in cash. <laughs> the maid finds him the next morning. He is cross-dressing. Because this is, so let's just put things in perspective here for the era. Because this is early 90s. And the stage that Blake has set up is that they are that him and Nick are both child molesters. Yes. And that his partner couldn't handle it anymore. That's what's in the note to say that I can't uh, handle what we did in Florida. What we did in Florida and... stuff like that. But then also on top of that, just to address like the early nineties, that him being a cross dresser was a problem and him also having gay yeah. magazines was con- like added to him being a no but those were pedophile magazines though i don't know if all of well, them were as, as, especially with the church <laughs> you know because, that's true because mm-hmm. he's like the head of the church mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. no no like, he's not a, just, he's not the head of the church he's a councilman oh, i'm sorry he's just some councilman sorry, guy that's right. it's just affiliated with yeah church. but just affiliated with the church is insinuated that the money was from something from florida where the mm-hmm. with the child molestation allegations and you know and it's not a stretch considering Denzel's mustache. <laughs> yeah, but I get where you're going, Dominic, is that back then it would have, it was okay to insinuate that someone was a child molester would also be... You're saying, though, that you're right. Like it was the, Back then it was okay to link those two together and be like, yeah. well, look at this. Like, he's gay. And he's, he's gay. Processed. That means he he's probably does things you know? to children. Yeah, yeah. But right, back nowadays, in that era. you can't do that. No, no, no. because, I mean, for obvious reasons, it's not true. But that's part of Blake's plan. Yeah. Is to make them seem like they're sexual deviants. It's another thing. It's another. It's just another one of those spots in movies from the 90s or 80s where you're like, that didn't age well. Mm. We've seen it before. Like, mm. oh, that, that actually did not age well. That joke is not, or whatever that. <laughs> then Nick has to go down to the DA office. Priscilla has a bunch of questions for him about how did you pay for it? Where did the money go? Why? How, we see how these things can link up. Here's what, pictures of you with these kids on your lap. <laughs> yeah, it's on the newspaper. Uh, the newspaper's already picked it up, and here's this picture of you with children saying he, you're now an accused child molester. If Blake had put this much effort into the robbery, he would have never got caught. I know! <laughs> if he had just put this much thought in not jumping off that canopy, <laughs> he wouldn't be in this situation. So, <laughs> most people would have to step down and like, no, no, they just let him, like, okay, we believe you. They continue to give him the benefit of the, the doubt. The benefit of the doubt. We're going to believe you here. He goes home. He's sitting in the car out on the street drinking with Doyle. Friend. They're just getting drunk in the car. Then Doyle's going to drive home. And then this is when Blake kidnaps him to stage the next phase of his diabolical plan, which, to his credit, these are some great ideas that he's got. Like, like if you want to ruin someone. You really someone, want someone to do that to you. You really huh? want to ruin someone. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, if you want to kidnap me and lock me in a room with a bunch of coke and hookers, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I was gonna say, like this this next part of the plan, not too terrible. Get some high, get some laid, makes a porno. I don't like, know. Clearly, it's Sykes' first time doing a porno, but the chick, like, she's experienced. This is like her fifth or sixth. Yeah, porno but he got the clap at this from point. it. But he does get the clap. Well, and, she, and also, she's one of those breasts with no nipples. So. <laughs> so, but none of this is that big of a deal because, I mean, he could still be mayor after this, like Mary and Barry was. <laughs> Just saying, she had no nipples, all right? It's weird. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Nick's house, his wife is scared, talking to Doyle that he's going to go find him. But there's this trap that they that Blake has set for Nick. They've got the sex tape now. They got him doing drugs. They go dump him on the street. 
But then when he gets picked up and goes to the hospital. He just sounds like a raving lunatic because he's like, it's Blake. And they're like, Blake's dead. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, even his wife. She's like, I don't believe you. You sound crazy. Like when he's at the hospital, even before she knows about the clap (laughs) and the cocaine and heroin and everything else. She's like, yeah, you sound really crazy. That guy's dead. And also, um, I I don't know. I couldn't go through all this work to set up to set this up like this who would actually do such a thing but then his arrogance yeah there you comes go up being cocky again he, he mm-hmm. runs into the reporter and he's like well come on let's go see the place where they held me i'm gonna show you and then he goes and it's just like old lady calisthenics <laughs> 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 it's old lady swimming in the pool for exercise. <laughs> things are going so well for blake he should start this as a business he should p- do these plans mm-hmm. for people for when you want to get revenge because there's absolutely 100% without a doubt no way Nick can overcome this. And the actions that he takes next make it significantly worse where he is at home and he stays up all night drinking. And then he wakes up the next morning and his wife left a note that they're going to the park. He runs out in his robe and then busts right, down a clown shoot. at gunpoint. Well, that was okay. <laughs> yeah. That was the only and part so, of this movie that I was down with. Shoot that fucking movie. <laughs> shoot him right in the face. <laughs> yeah, but but just just how this looks. He's in his robe, stinking yeah. of liquor, pointing a gun at a clown, scaring a bunch of children at a park, and he's an accused pedophile. Like, also, the, all those kids are like, rich kids too. Their parents were well, like like the yeah. mayor's kid or whatever, like city councilman, some church <laughs> leaders, kid, all so, these people. <laughs> So, like, checkmate, right? Like, there's nothing yep. else Blake can possibly do to him after this. Like, like pretty much done. I mean... I don't know. It, it kind of sounds like Melissa saying that if you would have shot that clown, it all would have been forgiven. I don't like clowns, people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't like clowns one bit. <laughs> and if you're a clown, then don't listen to us. <laughs> it's also right before this that Nick finds out that he's got the clap like on speakerphone and yeah. his wife overhears it. And he's like, yeah, now I know I got the clap. What do you want me to say? <laughs> like, I tried to fight hey, him with every no inch good of my way body. To explain that you have the clap. Like, yeah. There's just no good way he to tries, do it. You're right, like, Dominic. it was accidental. <laughs> he tries to say, I fought her with every inch of my body, which is like terrible phrasing it's- to begin with. And then she says, I can think of seven inches that didn't fight. And I, wow, okay, wow, okay. So we're learning a lot about Denzel here. One is, we thought you were going with a lot more than seven inches. (laughs) 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 We disappointed. No, I'm just kidding. You're no doll. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we need Brandon Lee there for Michigan. Like we need to know why <laughs> he saw it. He knows it's the biggest one he's ever seen. Well, in that scene too is when he sees the video that Blake had made where he had gone upstairs with with his kids. He was clearly in his house and he pulls out that axe. So his arrogance again at mm-hmm. the DA's office, like, listen, I have the proof right here though. Here's this video of Blake attacking my girls. He puts it in the tape and it's straight to porno. <laughs> like high quality porno. Oh, yeah. too. Like, <laughs> but my thing Oh is- man, he's giving it to her. <laughs> Why does he re- why does he like, oh no, I need to rewind this? Like, why does he just stop right there? He's like, no, no, wait, I, I don't rewind. know. But like at this point, the cocaine's making him sound super paranoid too, because he's like tripping over himself. Yeah, like, no, wait, I was there and I said no, but I don't know. And then they show it on the news and it's like redacted. <laughs> Like, don't show your he's children still, this. He, but it still looks he's like still a still throwing it to her. He's still throwing it to her. It's on the news. Blurred. It's all it's, all it's blurred, blurred is like the, her butt and her breasts. <laughs> Everything else like the, the, that, the that actually that should actually help his polling. <laughs> I just couldn't believe the news too. They're like, here's like we warn you if you told that and not like blur her totally out, then adults would <laughs> only adults would understand like we know what's happening here. Yeah, no. Like, no. <laughs> Wait, we're almost to the good part. <laughs> 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 all right so things can't be all bad finally someone does some actual police work his ex-partner does all of the police work finds the missing witness that we've all been worried about <laughs> he's gonna explain it all he solved the whole case he knows that the Aryan brotherhood is people who he attacked and also who who, who he was kind of partnered with and he, they had learned that they were going to meet up at this bookstore and so then Doyle and Nick go down to the bookstore to go muscle this Nazi 
who gets what he deserves. Yeah. No. And he tries to play like, you're a cop, you need to protect me. And Doyle's, I, I'll see anything that's happening. He just like lets yeah. this happen there. But it's staged. It's 100% staged because then Blake's crony comes in, tricks him to come running down the street. They almost capture him, but Blake shoots and kills Doyle, then tosses the gun to Nick and says, you now framed for your best friend's murder, and then leaves. Which forensics would be able to say you really got shot from above lots of things would don't are out of place also why is he an idiot why did he why did he catch the gun (laughs) it's just like is this just gonna be the rest of his life like he goes in orders a bagel and he switches it for a croissant like and then pops out like gotcha like everything denzel does he's he's just gonna just screw it up now okay but am i the only one that thought that denzel was like not really that upset about it he's like well i gotta go (laughs) police are coming you've been my best friend for years you're dead on the street i gotta go see you later (laughs) Uh, and, and after he did all that police work too yeah he he did all that police work and he did all those years of him doing all that police work for Denzel, like, how did he ever get any of his other work done? <laughs> I, I'm one. I, I'm curious. He found the witness. Is the witness still okay? <laughs> dead. Can we have someone check on the witness? So now Nick has a plan. He goes home, gets his family, takes him over to the meth lab, since you're going to be safer here than you would be with the police, leaves his wife and his <laughs> two course. baby girls with ice tea. Because when, when you think safety for your family, you think meth lab. <laughs> no nah, but you think gangsters over <laughs> <laughs> then he's gonna go back to this building that sorry the same building but they're gonna take the yeah. girls and stuff downstairs i think because it's clearly no, he ice's takes the girls out of there they take lab. the girls out of there mm. uh-huh. they take, he, the, the big guy takes the girls all the way gone they're mm-hmm. gonna go somewhere else which credit to ice to after other meth lab. his best friend telling him you need to get out of this business yeah, know, or you're right? like or else and then says by the way i've been framed for child molestation and killing someone and all this other stuff can you watch my kids while i go with this crackpot scheme and ice is like yeah what else you need yeah no he said he was like he's yeah. the most trustworthy person i know so if he says that this is what it is that's what it is he i mean credit to him i Despite guess not his wife what that though. mustache looks like <laughs> yeah <laughs> so his plan is He's going to look like he's crazy. He's finally gone off the deep well, end. Well, I mean, it's not hard to be. <laughs> he's going to kill himself and then stage this where Blake's going to come to him. And then they're going to stage so that the press will see They'll see Blake, Blake. because Blake can't resist because that's not what Blake wants, right? Blake wants him to, like, wither and die like this long, drawn-out yeah. death. He doesn't want him to jump. And, he wants- and to where, get arrested. Yeah, and he wants him to get and arrested. this is yeah. where I kind of... Lo- this is where I kind of feel disappointed in Blake because he's done such a fantastic job. He's ruined his life in every way. And he should just be happy when he sees him on TV acting all Looney Tunes uh, on top of the meth lab before it blows up. But he just can't help himself. He's got to first go down there and then he's got to involve himself. So, and then he exposes himself and ruins his whole scheme, Donald Duck yep. style. <laughs> Like, like uh, I'm sorry, like Daffy Duck, you know, Looney Tune style. You know, <laughs> the plan goes off perfectly, including blowing up all Ice's meth. I'm not sure Ice T was aware his meth lab was going to be blown up. Uh, I have a <laughs> feeling he might have not let him use his meth lab had he known. Between that and the absolute perfect jump that he makes off the roof into that laundry chute, yeah, I which know, is right? just big enough for him. I mean, a fraction of an inch either direction. He'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then this is kind of where things go off the rails, too, because it ultimately breaks into like a fight between them. And then they start climbing this big ass radio tower and like the whole time the news is filming and everything. And so like, like somehow at the end of all of this, Nick survives and Blake gets killed. And yet Nick somehow is absolved of all the child molesting that he's been doing I, and all yeah, the other illegal that stuff either. that he's guilty of. Like, I, I, I just... I, I don't understand. Like, at the end, like, like why did they have to go with the big fight? Like, he pretty much won. I don't know. I, I, I just don't, don't, I don't understand Nick's plan, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, I don't understand his plan either because just the fact that Blake is alive does not mean that there's still that sex tape. <laughs> like, so what? So He's that still, wild, yeah. 
that wild far-fetched story about how Blake was alive, that's true, but that doesn't mean any of the other stuff isn't true. So also like it's yeah, like the, by the end of it they're like, "Okay, that's it, you're good. Bye." And the reporter's like that uh, obviously that completely absolves him of all guilt, all guilt of wrongdoing. It's like, "Huh?" <laughs> but what about the kids in Florida? What about the clap? <laughs> He never got that <laughs> antibiotic. <laughs> he fell asleep and drank too much that night in that pink robe, but he never went and got those drugs. He still got the clap. <laughs> Just to recap Blake's plan here. I mean, not Blake, sorry. Nick's plan. Yeah. Nick's plan is to go on top of the roof, stage his death. So Suicide. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that all the media comes out to see this moment. He escapes. Eggs Blake on to come over to the towers to end it. Blake exposes himself, comes over. Isis gang is going to stop the police, but allow the press through. And then at the moment that Nick is ready for it, electrify the tower. And electrocute. To electrocute Blake. But then it's not quite enough. And so then Nick has to kick him off the tower and impale him on a spike. That's This is the plan. So isn't that murder? <laughs> that's what I thought. I mean, I'm just saying. I thought he just killed someone. Like, that's on top of the child molestation and everything. He's a murderer, too. I'm talking having the clap. I mean, maybe he can use the clap as why he went crazy. <laughs> but <laughs> seriously, though, he murdered him. He staged his death. Like, he, he whatever. He uh, he led to his death. So that's murder. He blew up that building. Yeah. He blew Dude, up like, up. he did all this stuff. Like, uh-huh. And Don't then worry, Gail says at the back. end. <laughs> Gail says at the end he, these exact words. The, the incontestable proof of his innocence. Because he murdered but that guy. Though. He conspired with a gang, a known gang, to take out police officers. There's so many crimes here. He should know <laughs> them. He's a district attorney. But that doesn't matter because the movie's over. He gets his wife back and gives her the clap. <laughs> Yeah. And- Which I don't know how he swung that one. Like, like of all the things, it yeah. you know, okay, all the crimes get dropped. Okay, okay fine. You didn't do any of those things. You're Why is his wife monster. coming back to him? Yeah, he still he still banged a prostitute and got the clap. You, you really gonna still, on video? He still yeah. Him? That might be a hard one. <laughs> have a hard one getting over that just saying i think what you can hear here here is things went off the rails in the last like 10 minutes of this movie i don't think they went off the rails in the last 10 minutes of this movie i think this movie was always this way <laughs> hmm. i think the story is crap <laughs> it doesn't make any sense it never made any sense <laughs> But I'll save that for my final thoughts. <laughs> yes, let's do that. <laughs> let's do that. Let's save it for our final thoughts because I think there's going to be some discussion around okay, that. Let's have a discussion. <laughs> let's stop. Let's go talk about the music that is in this movie. Then we'll come back to the debate over how when this story goes to crap. <laughs> Suspenseful music starts. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. To be honest with you, I didn't hear much music in this movie other than that super intense opening music. But I know that it's actually quite stacked when it comes to music, and it's got to be with Ice-T in it. So what do you got for us this week? A ton of music. So because there's so much and we don't want to drone on forever, we're going to kind of do this rapid fire style this week. So we're going to start out with the song Automatic by the Pointer Sisters. They are an R&B group from Oakland, California, and they've donned our music before. We've talked about the Pointer Sisters, how they won three Grammys and have spawned four decades, sold millions of records, and are actually still currently touring Although most of the uh, current lineup is made up of their kids. So, but our next song is Tough Enough by the Fabulous Thunderbirds. Mm. The Fabulous Thunderbirds were an American blues rock band formed in 1974. One of the founding members is lead guitarist Jimmy Vaughn, who is the older brother of Stevie Ray Vaughn. So they actually had quite a bit of mixed success over the years. They actually spanned quite a quite a long time. Like they opened up for like the Rolling Stones and stuff. So like they were a big enough band at, at one point. By the way, this song Tough Enough also featured in the films Gung Ho and Tough Guys. I guess when you pick out music for a living like for movies you're like i know this one 
<laughs> well, that's actually one of the things, like with the fabulous Thunderbirds and Jimmy Vaughn. Like that was one of the things I noticed is that they were really popular for score music. So it's like they asked this their band to make songs for this movie and this movie and this movie. Our next song is "Making Happy" by Crystal Waters. Crystal Waters was a singer songwriter of house and dance music. She, She's best known for her hits, hits Gypsy Woman and 100% Pure Love. Actually, her music kind of tailed off in the mid-90s, but she earned a degree from Howard University and worked as a computer tech for the DC Parole Board for years while Weird. raising two uh, two daughters. So yeah, she actually went on. She like got a degree. She was a, raised two daughters on her own. Good for her, Crystal Waters. Yeah. Her daughter is singer-songwriter Ella Nicole. Mm. Talk about a career Our change, next, too. Yeah, no. From, like, house and dance music to working uh, as a computer tech. Our next songs are You Better Mind and O oh Freedom by the St. John, John's Methodist Church Gospel Choir. And guys, they're a church choir. I got nothing. <laughs> it's the church choir. They're Methodist, so I don't think they really believe in a lot of stuff. It's... <laughs> Methodists are very open-minded <laughs> religious people. <laughs> I'm just saying, they're kind of a church choir, I guess. <laughs> Shots fired at Methodists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I'll give it to them all. Just wait, <laughs> Presbyterians, it's coming. <laughs> coming for you. <laughs> Our next song is I Love Your Smile by Shanice. Her full name is Shanice Wilson, but she's known as Shanice. And she had hits with the songs Silent Prayer, Saving Forever for You, and When I Close My Eyes. Actually, she was in show business since she was a kid. So she w she was in a KFC commercial with Ella Fitzgerald when she was nine years old. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald wait. was in a KFC Ella Fitzgerald was in a KFC commercial? Like, yes, one of the Shanice. One of the greatest singers of all time, Ella Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. Yes. With a nine-year-old pop star named Shanice, who would then, by age 11, compete on Star Search and then become part of a regular cast of the first 13 episodes of something called Kids Incorporated. Oh, my God. So, you never heard of Kids Incorporated? <laughs> no. It was, like a, it was like a variety how, show. Then how have you never heard of Shanice? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that was the same person. But Kids Incorporated was like this, like like a kids show where they would they would sing and they would sing like modern songs, but like it was like a the, the kids bop of my our generation. But they would like act. Okay, and then which they were one was Shanice? And, I don't know. <laughs> I just remember the show. But she sang this song. She must be the main girl then. Yeah, clearly. I don't know. I don't well, know the name. She... I just remember the show. So that brings us to Chick Mystique by. Cheek, chick. So, uh, which, by the way, they, they're currently known as Niles Rogers and Chick. Chick formed by, in 1974 by Niles Rogers and Bernard Edwards. So I'm assuming someone must have sued someone. That's why he has to go by Niles Rogers and Chick <laughs> now. They are responsible for many very popular, commercially successful disco songs. Disco songs like Dance, 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 Everybody Dance, La Freak, I Want Your Love, Good Times, and a whole list of other songs that involve the word dance. <laughs> Damn, actually, they, they do, for that era of music, they do have a lot of hits. Dude, and they have. All right, and I've been doing this music segment since Miami Vice. So, like, I've done a bunch of these. They have the longest list of past members I've ever seen. <laughs> Everybody in the 80s was in Chick at one point in time, and they wrote a song that had the word dance in it, apparently. <laughs> hey, they are so. very clear about what to expect out of their music. There's going to be a group I of people gonna... you have you have never seen before. Even if you saw them yesterday, it might be new people, and they're going to have you dance. And I could have gone a lot more in-depth into them, but we're doing rapid fire. We're just going to keep moving it along. But if we ever do come back to them, like, there's a whole drug field movie somewhere in Czech, I'm sure. <laughs> but our next song is Next to Me by Donald D. And Donald D is Donald Lamont. He is a rapper, record producer, 
member of the Zulu Nation, but he is best known as a member of Ice T's Rhyme Syndicate because mm. this is an Ice T movie. That kind of makes sense that a an Ice T rapper would be in this movie. Our next song is Killer by Seal, and Seal is Henry a sweet. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the best part. Wait, wait. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. This is seal as in seal seal. Like kiss from the rose yes. seal. Okay. Kiss from a rose seal. Crazy seal. The seal? So, the, yes. the, the same seal that you took a picture of him and his family <laughs> and then superimposed yes. your face on seal and sent it out as Christmas cards. Yes, but don't tell him that. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say it. John broke up their marriage. <laughs> I did. I They're did. They're divorced now. Even Heidi, Heidi Klum, Klum didn't make it through that fiasco of Christmas cards going out. <laughs> and that was my intention. <laughs> just to remind, just just to clarify for everyone out there, we're talking about a real situation that happened in which John sent Christmas cards with Heidi Klum and Seal, but put his own face <laughs> on Seal. <laughs> And his but, family. But the rest of his I body was his still there, in it too. for the it's, record. Yeah, it's, it's, it's his whole family in Seal's body, <laughs> but John's head <laughs> sent them out. It made me Christmas. look like I had really big arms. <laughs> sent it out as for real printed Christmas cards. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why we didn't save that. Why didn't I save still that? have some. <laughs> I do. I still have some, actually. <laughs> so his name is Henry a uh, uh, loose egg, uh, loose, uh, loose egg seal. one, <laughs> and to <laughs> Samuel. I wanted to get the name. All right. Well, he sold over 20 million records. The Kiss from a Rose is probably his biggest. That was featured in a Batman movie. He was married to Heidi Klum. They got divorced. Since then, things have not gone well as he is a coach on the Australian version of The Voice. Mm. So, That's the apparently <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm just saying, he's not, you know, like, he's not Heidi Klum, who's on, like, American reality shows. He's on Australian reality shows, which is, like, <laughs> Kathy Gifford. Like, <laughs> I did not know this, but apparently this song actually was kind of what broke him out. Because uh, up until then, he would he had played in clubs like uh, with a club with a group called Push. He was also in a blues band for a while, but pretty much he was just playing clubs. Like he didn't even think he was that good of a singer until he met this producer named Ad Adam Ski or Adam Sky, and they collaborated on this song. And then this song was popular, and he got a record deal off this song, and that would lead to him marrying Heidi Klum, which I never understood. And I'm glad they're divorced <laughs> because now I can marry Heidi Klum. I think Heidi Klum's already married to somebody else. I hate to break it to you. She's been married Time like for a new Christmas card. John. I'm working on that too. <laughs> She's been married I have like an twice. Elaborate plan. Over. <laughs> I have an elaborate plan, and it involves a prostitute with the clap and drugs. <laughs> <An> empty pool. <laughs> yes, I'm so, not saying not so saying this movie gave me any ideas. <laughs> so what you're saying is you're going to do some drugs and go have sex with a prostitute with the clap. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> And then when you're done, you'll come up like with a better cool. one. <laughs> I never thought about going to have sex with a prostitute and doing drugs. This movie enlightened me. I might get the clap. <laughs> okay. Our Stellar last plan. song. Oh. <laughs> Our last song is Ricochet by Ice-T. And it is literally a rap song about the movie Ricochet by Ice-T. <laughs> it's the song they wrote to end the movie. <laughs> To end the movie, to then explain the movie to you in case you weren't paying attention, <laughs> and you needed to to recap it in rap form. <laughs> they even rap about the clap. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So, and more about Ice T and going into his music career. So he gets out of the army. This is this is how. And by the way, like like a lot of this is pulled from different interviews he's done. So it's tough to know to what extent he was involved in all of this. But from what I can gather, Ice-T leaves the military, goes back. He's a bank robber, like robbing heist bank robber, uh, like masks on, like heat bank robber style. Does that for a little bit. Apparently sold pot and, and other miscellaneous gangster style stuff. He was a jewel thief for a while, like smashing cases and stealing jewels. Apparently his friend Shawnee Sean 
did a bit for him for some jewels that he helped steal. So damn. good on you, Shawnee Sean. Like, damn, that's a dude that you pay. But apparently he just wasn't wasn't making a lot doing it. He had a kid at this point. He had a kid in high school. So he decides he's going to try and make it. Uh, he had been doing the MC aside from being a pimp and a jewel thief. He was an MC. So so literally, what's that movie with Terrence Howard? Um, hustle and flow. It's hard out here. Hustle and flow. Like literally, he's hustle and flow. He's pimping and trying to make MCing work, but he's also s- stealing jewels. And apparently, he won an MC contest judged by Curtis Blow, and that helped him get a record deal. And I forgot that he was also in a heavy metal band called Body Count. Mm-hmm. So like, oh yeah, this is very early on in rap and so some of this was rap some of this was just like militarized poetry uh set to heavy metal music like at the point of this movie like he was just as much of a heavy metal influence as he was a rap influence i think oh yeah he would release the album power that would change the world it would go platinum rap would be a thing he would start doing movies like nwa would be a thing and he would become ice t who is forever himself as a character, no matter what movie he's in, he's Ice-T. <laughs> you know? <laughs> even playing a part on SVU, he's still Ice-T playing a cop. Like, yeah. even on the show, like, his character should be Detective Ice-T. <laughs> so, and yes, he did the song Reckless Rivalry, which was featured in the movie Breaking 2 Electric Boogaloo, but it was <laughs> not on the soundtrack. There's should music from Jewel Thief and Pimp. Like, I'm telling you, Hustle and Flow might be about Ice-T. <laughs> Hey, we also know that you're not worth anything if you didn't appear in a break-in movie. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much. I mean, he yeah. did it. Yeah. <laughs> but and by the way, he's also married to a woman named Coco of all things. So she's pretty famous. So Coco has they had their own uh, reality TV show on E. So she's oh, yeah. very funny and like I really I, I like Ice T, but I well, she's really funny and she had, they have a little girl and my absolute favorite thing w- from MTV Cribs is when they went to Ice T's house like and this is my bedroom and then you go in there and he's got a camera on a tripod pointing <laughs> at the bed. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing is actually from that same episode, but it's later on in the episode and they're walking through and he stops and there is a uh, periodically through his house. Ice-T has soda machines and snack machines. <laughs> and it's so when people come over to visit, they can buy snacks and drinks because it ain't a free ride. Yeah. He's like, no, you can't have my food in the refrigerator. No. Yeah, You can pay. If you're hungry, you can buy these chips. That's what I'm saying. Beer ain't free. <laughs> well, John, the music actually covered a wider swath than I was expecting. And I also didn't expect to have shots fired at both Meth- Methodists and Presbyterians. <laughs> I guess I should have seen seal. it come. <laughs> seal. Poor <laughs> Seal. I guess I should have seen it coming with Ice T being in the music. <laughs> so, all you Seal loving Methodists, <laughs> bring it. <laughs> All right, let's go give our final thoughts on this one because I think there's going to be some differing opinions about the movie Ricochet. Let's go give our final thoughts. All right, John, I'm going to have you kick us off on our final thoughts. What is your final thoughts of this movie? Aside from a little bit of the tr- the standard 90s-ish occasional corniness, which is going to happen from a movie this old. Talk in 1991 long time ago there's gonna be a few scenes like you said that just don't time well otherwise dude john lithgow's plan is awesome to the extent <laughs> that he goes to ruin this man's life like it is fantastic all the way up to the point in which denzel acts like a crazy man and blows up the meth lab i am so down with everything and then they kind of ruined it for me i can't they didn't ruin it i wish they had just ended the movie a little bit sooner because i he had done such a fantastic job of ruining his life. Ended it any other way. He breaks down and shoots Blake and then, you know, goes to jail for killing his partner. But like 90 style action can't end that way. It can't end on a sour note for Denzel, even though John Lithgow has done such a fantastic job, such a thorough job of ruining his life. Like every detail thought of, every part of the plan executed to a T. I would have been happy if he had just, if they had ended it and he had just skipped off and John Lithgow was living on some island thinking he got away with it. 
<laughs> you know? Or maybe then Denzel has to come up with his own scheme to get him back. You can tell it took so long setting up John Lithgow's plan. They didn't have time for for an elaborate Denzel Washington plan. They kind of just had to rush it along. But man, all the way up to that point, they had me. And then get it at end so quick that it kind of, you kind of lose something. And like, well, now I kind of know why it's like one of the forgotten Denzel movies, you know, instead of there's a chance where it's like, I might have liked this one more than like out of time. But like, they just, <laughs> they ruined it at the end. I agree with you, John, that this movie is it's an hour and 42 minutes long and it is 90 minutes of great 90s action and 12 minutes of whoopsie daisy (laughs) we forgot the ending (laughs) um i think you're right he spent they spent so much time that blake's plan is so perfect there's literally no way to get out of it and i watched this movie not when it came out but probably like 92 93 maybe 94 and i remember being like this movie is awesome this movie is fantastic it is great and now watching it this week it's 90 percent awesome and 10 percent whoopsie daisy we don't have an ending here so let's just hurry up and rush this thing through i still love this movie i still really 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 like it i'm willing to forgive the ending that happens here because everything else is so great. It's such a diabolical plan. Goes off without a hitch. Just when you think it can't get any worse for Nick. Surprise! It gets much, much worse. So I, I still really do like this movie. I just can't watch it on a frequent basis because the ending is so frustrating. You have to go long enough in between that you kind of forget all the little stuff that happens. That way when it happens again, you're like, oh my god, now what's going to happen? He killed his partner and he was wearing gloves. <laughs> oh my god, what the hell is he going to be able to do now? And you get the end like, oh yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's, <laughs> it's like running the 100 meter hurdles at the Olympics and hitting every one of them perfect and being in first and then face planning on the last hurdle. Yep. But I saved Melissa for last very for a very specific reason. Because John and I both just swooned over this movie except for the ending. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I did not swoon. I thought this movie was crap. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because he's I a remember, child molester? Yeah, that too. No. <laughs> I remember I remember us watching this when we were dating. You know, that was a long time ago. But and watching it be like, oh yeah, this is a pretty good movie. And yes, I thought like, okay, well, when we talked about doing this movie, I was like, yeah, I'm excited. I like this movie. It's got Denzel in it. Like, it's a good movie. It does not hold up. The movie does not hold up. The acting, I'm sorry. I love Denzel. But maybe the way they wrote it, maybe something else. I don't know. It's crap. <laughs> It's not good. John Lithgow is not scary. He's Harry and the Hendersons best friend. He's not scary. His stupid haircut, everything about it is stupid. Also, I am so tired of this, the old trope of like, ha ha, I'm going to murder your family. I'm going to use your kids to scare you. And I don't like that. I never did. And it's it's tired. It's used up. It's not imaginative. Yes, the imaginative part was giving them the clap. <laughs> <laughs> forcing him to, uh, all that's that part, some revenge right there yeah i mean listen that part was imaginative and yes it was different than other action movies that we've seen and yes that part i'm like okay yeah but the whole like sneaking into your house and drugging people and pretending like you may or may not hurt someone's children it's used up and old and it's not like it was never a good storyline that movie doesn't have Do a good think- story <laughs> just saying it just doesn't <laughs> Nothing. And Do you think he sent you, his crony out? Go get a prostitute and make sure she has the clap. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder if that was like part of it too. Like, yeah. Anyways, I don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe as I've aged, I've changed my opinion on movies. But this movie was not good. And the ending alone, there was yeah, the ending was like the rest of the movie for me. I was like, oh well, it just took a crap because the whole thing's crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, true story about time changing. Because if we had watched it when we were dating, that's about two decades ago. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's been quite a while <laughs> yep. since that time. That's what I'm that was a long time ago, and maybe I'm a different person. But I have watched plenty of action movies from that era and been like, yeah, it's good. You know, like there's some parts that don't hold up. That movie didn't hold up at all. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, actually, I think it is. I love Denzel Washington, but that movie was like, ugh. (laughs) Don't make me watch it again. (laughs) Listen, people, it doesn't get any better than Melissa's hot takes when she doesn't like something. (laughs) Doesn't happen that often. So take this soak this moment in when <laughs> melissa's like the ricochet fucking sucks because it doesn't happen that often 
<laughs> you don't get angry. I'm going to tell you how it is, Melissa, very often. <laughs> And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear your hot take, your fire, your how much you love or hate this movie. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Go to the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the other ways to contact us. Twitter.com slash go with the heat. Instagram.com slash go with the heat. Facebook.com slash go with the heat. Hell, I think we even have a Tumblr. Nice shit on there, but we got one. You can message us on Tumblr if you want to. We would love to hear from you. Email us, tweet, Instagram, whatever it is. And, you know, by the way, if you don't follow us on Instagram, you're out of your dad damn mind. You know that? Because on Instagram, not only do you get like, clips from the show, but you get clips from the movie, pictures from the movies, and the single greatest descriptions on Instagram. <laughs> Hands down, there's no better descriptions on Instagram than well, what the you fact get that with you it. write them. <laughs> That's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> you should be following us on Instagram, Instagram.com slash go with the heat. And also, you know what helps people find the show? Is if you leave us a review, you rate us or leave us a review on iTunes or your podcast, your platform of choice. Not a, you know, it's kind of hard to find good podcasts now. There's so many people that have podcasts, it's really hard to find good podcasts now. So go to iTunes, leave us a five star review. There's no other options. You can only get five star reviews. It's it's not my system. This Sorry, is the way I, Apple set it up. I didn't make up. it. I, I didn't make the system. Is. This that's is just that's the way that's they that's set that. it up. You can only get five stars. Then write a description, but no one ever reads the description. So don't write anything about the show. We want you to go in there and write a description okay. about Include, the clap. Uh, write a description <laughs> ab- about your favorite seal song, but it can't be <laughs> "Kiss from a Rose." <laughs> if we get well, enough, let's see. Let's see if they can even come up with one. <laughs> i tell you what if you go and leave that review or you send us an email if we get enough of those we get five or more reviews and or emails to the show we will publish john's christmas card yeah <laughs> Oof. speaking of two decades ago <laughs> <laughs> you will get a super that's fine special. i want Heidi to see it <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.